to tell you a little bit about the community of artists that are responsible for this story, which really the um, inspiration, the impetus uh, was the strike on the World Trade Center. Now, that was obviously the starting point. The way it develops from there, I think it diverges quite a lot in very interesting ways. But very briefly, this is a community of picture storytellers, itinerant bards who perform, that is, they sang um, stories uh, while they were displaying pictures. Now, these pictures take the form of scrolls, and uh, Zulfikar, in fact, has one in his room. So they could vary, range between 6 feet to, t to 30, uh, depending on how much energy you have, really, and what kind of story you want to tell. Um, usually, the width is about two and a half feet. Uh, so long, narrow scrolls, um, and like scrolls, they are kept rolled up, paper backed with cloth. So, which is why the scroll is called a pot, pot in Sanskrit, which means cloth. Uh, the tradition, uh, the singers, the the performers get the name from the scroll, potua, displayer of scrolls. I prefer not to use the term because it has acquired some negative properties, since this was a mode of begging arm-seeking in the past, um, so they prefer to be called Chitrakar artist, painter, higher status, which is of fairly recent uh, origin, but already it tells you that this is a community in transition. And um, in fact, uh, interestingly, through the course of the 20th century, we've been having really swings of conversion between Islam and Hinduism, um, so back and forth. So this is, as of now, and for some time now, at least for the last 40 years, a community that professes Islam uh, but displays and paints and sings uh, to pictures from and stories about the Hindu pantheon, by and large. Though you do have, again, stories about the peers, uh, holy men, uh, in the Muslim tradition, who would again be mediating between the Prophet um, and us, worldly mortals, lesser mortals on this world. Now. Um, Again, so there I, I could go into this later, but I don't have the time now. Uh, there are interesting ways in which obviously uh, this kind of tradition is authors, is authorized. Uh, the fact that you have the ability and in fact can claim a, a kind of traditional knowledge by which then you are allowed to be interpreters of the world at large. That's a very interesting area to go into, but I'm not going to go into over here unless I'm specifically asked to. Now, um, the other point, I'm going to leave the introduction for now. Obviously, this is authorized by myth, uh, where they are supposed to be the offspring of the celestial architect Vishwakarma. Interestingly, though, the offspring of the celestial architect Vishwakarma are Muslims. And there are interesting stories that go into this as well. Uh, the other point that I should mention, which is directly related to this story, um, is the fact that um, this is a professional community of entertainers. Um, so it was not as if this was a part of ritual art, a uh, part of domestic ritual, as are many of the folk arts in India, which later on gets professionalized, like with Mithila or Varli painting. They were always professionals, but seen as very poor arm seekers as such. Now, the other interesting feature about them is that um, they tell both stories from the myths both Hindu, Muslim, and Christian, as well as uh, stories that are really composed around uh, secular events, historical events, like the one that I'm going to be talking to you about today. Now, it was actually um, more or less this mode of entertainment, and it is village entertainment by and large. So they didn't really, were not tied up with uh, richer and more courtly patrons. It was very much a sort of folk entertainment, uh, had more or less died out by the late 80s. And it is only at that point in certain pockets, because this is an extremely diverse community scattered all over Bengal, as well as the borders of Bihar, which is the neighboring state, Jharkhand, uh, where they even going in, go into the more Adivasi, the aboriginal uh, pockets of, of India, main, mainland India. Now, can everyone hear me at the back? I can speak louder, if that's all right. Okay. Now, um, the point that I do need to make here is that this particular pocket, which is Mednipur, one of the districts of Bengal, suddenly saw a revival of this particular style <coughs> or new creation, I don't know, uh, because of the government patron, patronage. 
uh, we are talking about the left, uh, a, a coalition of left parties uh, that came to power in Bengal uh, in the late 70s, early 80s. And as with many sort of left-leaning governments, they have a specific cultural policy. And that is to actually uh, even disseminate messages, not just ideolo well, ideological messages, but also messages uh, regarding their policies and social welfare mes uh, measures through uh, folk cultural forms. So it's really in the late 70s and early 80s that you have a renewal of interest where artists, actually there were again many workshops held, artists were encouraged to revive these styles of performance. And it's interesting that um, museum collections, and there are a few in Kolkata and some of the other districts, uh, became a source uh, for this kind of renewal of the painting at any rate. And of course, uh, artists were encouraged to create new scrolls. And of course, there was always a tradition of also creating scrolls and stories around spectacles and spectacular events, secular events, and so on. So uh, around social messages, things like mal malaria programs, health programs, AIDS more recently, adult literacy, um, so on and so forth. Now, it is at that point that a lot of women actually get involved in this process. Otherwise, as with many other traditional professions, women were not usually part of those because they would be out married. You didn't want secrets of your family to go with the woman. But it is at that point that a lot of women enter this profession. So you have the first artists uh, from the late 70s. Um, I'm not going to be showing any of that generation of women's work here, but quite a few of the artists whose pictures you'll be seeing today are actually women. Um, and some of the important ones as well. Now, interestingly, the folklore goes that the men didn't know how to receive these new initiatives. They thought it was a waste of time. So they sent their wives and daughters and sisters off to these workshops and these artist camps. And of course, they came back uh, with this kind of skill and resource. Um, so the women got a sort of edge over the men. I mean, that, that it's part of folklore, but it's still interesting. Now, since then, there have been several attempts to start cooperatives in sync with uneven success. But I'm going to stop there now. Um, but you can clearly see that over time, what's happened since the late 70s, and why I mention is that the burden of storytelling has increasingly shifted to the painted scroll. Uh, uh, part of, I think, the initiative of all governments that have come to power in India, whatever state they may be, whether they're uh, governments of different local governments or at the center, um, there has always been an interest in trying to encourage the folk arts and the folk crafts as a kind of commodity production on a small scale so that at least uh, it could be marketable and financially viable, if not on a global scale. So commoditizing of the folk arts is a very important um, policy of governments, at least so that these art forms and these communities that maybe were dependent on these forms were self-sustaining. Now, of course, it does mean that earlier, most of these were seasonal activities. Well, these were really, really poor people. So they were agriculture, landless laborers, and they did all kinds of other things. This becomes a mainstay, 24 uh, round, round the year kind of activity, which it never was before. How long it's going to be sustainable, we don't really know at the moment it is. Now, coming to this uh, performance tradition, now think of uh, a rolled up scroll. Um, sorry, you don't have anything bigger. You open one register at a time. Uh, using your finger, you would point to particular aspects of the pictures in this particular frame and say, now, some people have assumed that means that the relationship between that's the concept, uh, you have been profusely thanked by both Zulfikar and myself. Not at all. We thought you might have sort of not found, found it easy to find the place. Yes. But that's what happened. Sorry. Yes, I've just begun. So I give you a quick summary at the end of it. But so I'm just describing the scroll. So the song and the painter are uh, painting are really telling parallel stories, as if they're two different registers. So the song, uh, remember, even though the community of painters and singers are the same here, but they need not be the same person. So actually, a singer could sing to someone else's scroll. 
So obviously you can see that the paintings have to be general enough, they are stock figures like this one, uh, around which there could be multiple interpretations. So think about um, the music as lending a kind of aura, a suggestibility uh, to the images, which I will talk more about. So there is a kind of divergence in the story, in, in the performance as such, the hearing and the painting, not completely synchronized. Huh? And so th that, that leaves a sort of space open for the play of imagination as we will see as we go along. It's not exactly a one-on-one -on -one relationship where the picture illustrates the word. Um, the term that's used is dhvani suggestion, where there's a kind of resonance around the images. Um, now, given the fact that this scroll is unfolded and rolled up again, one register at a time, you can see there's a kind of after image that remains in the mind. And the way uh, the pictures are composed, see, would necessarily point upwards. It's as if the pictures themselves, the figures in the pictures are telling you, remember, remember what preceded. So there's an interesting fore and back shadowing going on, but as I will try and show, also very interesting lateral indication, side shadowing which I will uh, say more about as we go along. Now, why did I choose this particular subject for this talk? Well, actually, it's more than just uh, a hope that it might have some popular appeal. I think it's important for me to be able to show um, and to maybe go against some of the popular representations of folk art, folk culture. We assume a bounded community. Uh, which also becomes quite static over time, you know. So you, the artists are unconscious vessels, great vessels, of course, but of a tradition that transcends them. So I really choose this particular subject to be able to talk about innovation and novelty within a folk art form. Well, certainly there is this notion of collective creativity, but within that it, it is the efforts of individuals that resonate with the tradition and then which are picked up and developed on over time, right? So the, the, and creativity is tied up with novelty somewhere along the line. So I'm thinking of this as an emergent art form, an emergent tradition and an emergent community. Remember, think of all the shifts that have taken place with nationalism and with the politics of India from the 19th to the 20th century. I did mention that there have been repeated waves of conversion uh, between Hinduism and Islam, back and forth, back and forth. So it really is an interstitial group and that uses their interstitial status in very interesting and self-conscious ways right now. So again, to give you another very brief uh, background uh, sort of nugget of information which is important, they also sometime around the 1930s, uh, in the nationalist period, they also become the kind of embodiments of a folk spirituality. So a nationalist, uh, he was uh, in the Indian civil services, uh, the nationalist Guru Shodai Dotto, has the, the first person to have actually written on this tradition. He has one of the important collections of this kind of scroll painting and has written on the songs in 1931. Now, for him, actually, uh, they were the people we should hold up as exemplars and they were the legitimizer for our search for a secular India. So again and again, by using these kinds of folk traditions, there was also an attempt to try and root secularism as an indigenous concept, uh, an idea rather than one that we have adopted from the West because of colonization. So now, why am I mentioning this? Because it, there's an interesting way in which it reflects back on the community and becomes a way of crystallizing a certain voice, uh, which you will definitely see in the story that I'm going to be talking about today. Now, um, the story is, of course, the impetus uh, was the strike on the World Trade Center. Now, interestingly, unlike many other uh, new themes uh, of global importance, not the local ones, like the tsunami one, for instance, there's usually a patron or some kind of impetus that comes from an outside force. This could be um, a particular patron 
it could be actually someone who comes from abroad and decides that a museum curator, for instance, who comes in and plants the seed of an idea. And of course, the way the story develops is, is very much the artist's own composition. But this, in fact, the initial impetus was a folk theater, a folk play called Jatra in Bengal, which is very melodramatic, that was um, enacted within two months of this event having taken place. So it was very, very contemporary. Uh, immediately, and I have um, documentation for this as well, there were at least two scholars, so this has become quite a scholar's village now, who were there at that time and who have written, uh, who have just briefly mentioned that they knew the first person who composed the scroll, and I'll talk about him a little while later. Now, that very night itself, I think after this uh, theatre, it was a travelling theatre company, uh, and the play they performed was called America Jolche, America is Burning. And of course, it was about the events. Uh, Bengali villages are highly politicized, about the events that led up uh, to 9-11. And uh, the last scene of the play ends with the towers, um, the, the plane crash, the towers collapsing. Now, this is where the song begins and the story begins for this uh, the way the story develops in the Potua tradition uh, for these scrolls. Now, I'll just quickly give you a, a brief introduction to the scroll itself. This is one of the four first scrolls that I saw and acquired. Now, over here, what you see is, um, you can clearly see that this isn't so much describing an event as marking a stage out for you. So very much in the way that you would present a traditional story where the first register is like what you would say an establishment shot in film or comic books, right? It's a kind of iconic presentation which sets the scene and the mood for what it is to follow. It tells us what the story is about. Now, it was very important for the artist. Remember, the composition takes place very soon after the event, before the event is finished and got over with. So the story was being composed while it was still unfolding. Initially, nobody knew who was responsible. Nobody claimed responsibility. But very soon, by implication from the kinds of messages you were getting and the celebrations, etc. And I'm not going to show them, but you have pots which show the scrolls, which show Osama's celebrations in the camp and so on. But I'm not showing that right now. But the story that gets stable is this one, where you have a first register. She, it's a, this one was a very narrow school. She didn't have space for two towers. Uh, but I think it was more than that. There's a reason why she uses only one column. You can see the burning tower on the top and a, a plane uh, with a bearded face on it. Now, whose face is it? The suggestion, the interpretation is left to us. Because the song, and I have about seven songs, uh, usually they preface. Some of them only talk about the pathos, the tragedy as such. Others emphasize the war and the fact that this is an event that is set apart. So it's called wondrous, ajob, ajab. The word is ajab ghatana, huh? a wondrous event. So already you have this sense in which you're supposed to think about it as being set apart from everyday life. It's not a local event. It's special in some senses, whichever way. Now, um, so, okay, first scene. Now, interestingly, if you remember, just concentrate on that pillar over here. Remember, this register would have been folded up, you move. Now, think of the same column. You have Osama, Bin Laden, you have Bush. Now, Bush is shown very much um, an iconography. The stock figure is that of a dandy. And the commander-in-chief of the gods, Kartikeya, in Bengal is often in popular iconography shown. You know, he has bar sort of hair up to here, uh, beardless. He's shown as a dandy. It's an interesting contradiction in a tradition that really plays on this idea of contradiction within the image itself. I, will, I hope if there's time, I'll come to it at the end. Now, the scene, the column shape, has become a kind of barrier, but remember also connects. Now, if you notice, they're speaking to each other on the telephone. Right? So where um, Bush phones Bin Laden and says, what did you do, my brother? <laughs> and of course, Bin Laden says, what had to happen has happened. That's it. Most of the songs. 
So you have this sense in which already you can see there's an, a relationship being established. Now in much of folklore, the idea of doubling, the fact that um, maybe the most extraordinary of conflicts or violence occurs within intimate relationships. Here definitely the idea of the fraternal of brothers, um, I'm thinking of Cain and Abel, which is very much part of this tradition. Remember, they are Muslim. Or of the Mahabharat war, the Kauravs and the Pandavs, where it's precisely something is irresolvable because they are so close. Huh? So it is the fraught nature of intimacy itself. And of course, in this case, the kinds of consequences it can have for the whole world is something that resonates within the mythic tradition, certainly in India, everywhere. We have this in many of our epics, as you would have in the biblical or the Quranic stories as well. So um, I'll come back to that much more self-consciously. The, the, the column, the tower, becomes the column, the barrier that separates, but also shows the relationship between the two. Third, now interestingly, this is the Gulf War. Right? This is the, um, sorry, this is the Afghanistan war, right? But notice the cannon. It's again a column. It's pointing upwards to the picture before, <coughs> not pointing at the enemy. So again, it's as if there's a, it's, it's a kind of paratactic device. It's a, it's a device that connects one register after. This is a sequential story. Remember, you're not seeing the image that went before. So it's as if you're being reminded and you're being asked very deliberately, think about what this could mean. So you're not focused on the historicity of the event, of its empirical nature, but already you're being asked to think of it as an abstraction. And as an abstraction, what are you supposed to be looking for? Certain kinds of relationships. OK, now, uh, scenes of destruction. And it's interesting how some of these images resonate because that spread eagle figure uh, also could be taken from the Jishu Mongol pot, the, the story of Christ, of which there are also such stories where you would uh, show Christ on his cross, for instance. But again, it's not as if it's saying, therefore, they are martyrs. They're not saying that. But it's as if there are multiple suggestions. Images resonate in different ways, and they mean contradictory things, good, bad, etc. Now, OK, you have Osama sort of disappearing into the Tora Bora mountains, into the cave itself. And again, you have many sort of gestures. Uh, the images themselves seem to gesture to the song and to the fact that these are supposed to be conversations with each other. In this tradition, very often the face is shown three quarters position, looking out at you, but also looking at the other. Profile is only meant for demons and other such evil figures. So there is a, a particular kind of stable iconography over here. Now, this is just to give you an idea of the story. Now, the very first pot, scroll that was ever composed, in fact, didn't have Osama's face on it, or a bearded face, whoever that is. Instead, it tried to, in their tradition, reproduce the crash and the events that unfolded afterwards, including scenes of relief and rehabilitation, a a local story was also woven in about a Bengali boy who was working in the World Trade Center, was about to come home for his engagement, and died. So there was an attempt to sort of give it a local twist, which actually falls out of the story very quickly as it circulates and stabilizes over time. The first person to actually put a face on the plane was that man's sister, Shornu Chitrakar, uh, which you found on the poster. Um, she has a tremendous visual intelligence. Now, again, um, a lot of people have said, but see, this already pins down agency. While if agency remains uncertain, you can do more things with the story. You can play with creative suggestions much more. But in a sense, I think by introducing this face, she allowed another possibility to open up, because this was taken up very fast. You don't find this story without the face anymore. Hmm? But I'll, you will see other things sort of flow from uh, being able to anthropomorphize the plane. Now, she also put in faces on lots of other things, including the fire engines that were part of relief and rehabilitation. That didn't gel. So over time, that motif has fallen out. 
So you see, it's interesting when you see a lot of experiments happening, and I was fortunate I was able to observe this. Um, some of them stay, become part of the collective repertoire, others fall by the wayside. So anyway, um, you can see already there's a reference to the fact that this is a global event, therefore it is mediatized. So our reception of it would be through the television screen. Also there is, and I have talked to many of the artists, there is also then an acknowledgement that their mode of storytelling may be one mode of storytelling amongst others. What would be the difference between television, news reading, one mode of telling the event, from their mode of telling the event? Hmm? There's also subtle uh, references uh, to that, that they are one amongst many other kinds of storytellers. Okay, now notice at some point, Osama is going into the caves. Now, other pictures show the mouth of the cave in far more detail with just Osama as an isolated figure, not as one at the head of his troops. Notice the inset. Just the way a religious icon is framed. Picture in an inset and often you see in pilgrimage centers and so on, bazaar prints, you will have the rest of the city or town being portrayed as the background, the image of the deity sort of right up in front in this kind of frame. Now, the song does not refer to a deification of Osama at all. In fact, there is no deification of Osama in this tradition, none whatsoever. But interestingly, what does develop is a tension and a contradiction within the scroll itself with these two images the demonic and the divine. Already in Indian aesthetic tradition, within the image itself, I mean, in the way that images are referred to, sacred images, rup prati rup, bim prati bim, there's a sense in which you're talking about an image or a reflection and its opposite. So there is no direct relationship between event and its representation, object and an image. Rather, especially as um, most uh, Treatise on images deal with sacred images. So you're dealing with the unmanifest. Date gods are ultimately unmanifest and the way they can be pictured as made manifest for our limited visions. So there's a contradiction between that. Um, stories about the first images will always tell you that the Buddha or whoever stood on a piece of cloth, cast his shadow and the shadow was painted. That was the first portrait. You did not dare to look at the vis visage of the divine. So now what is this picture doing over here? Now in, there is another particular story and uh, which is really the story of Satya Peer, again who's a sort of um, holy man, not a deity, but takes on many of the attributes of some of the tiger deities, the deities who are lords of the tigers and so on in Bengal. Right? Now, Satya Peer also has another incarnation as Satya Narayan. So, and, and within their own tradition, and much of uh, folk religion in Bengal, which is, remember, divided between the two major religions in Bengal are Hinduism and Islam. But you could see at the local level, and actually for all of us, uh, you would be obviously worshipping deities from the Hindu pantheon as well as paying homage to Peers because they also are alert to the wishes of their devotees. Mm -hmm. So there's a sense in which Satya Peer and Satya Narayan become two faces. And often in the mm -hmm. scrolls and the stories, they deal with Satya Peer. And remember, he's on his tiger here. Huh? So there is no way in which there is a direct reference being made. But somewhere in the imagery, of course, here you have the horse of Garbala. But I have also seen pictures, which I cannot reproduce because I don't have copyright, where you have Bin Laden on a tiger. So clearly a far more direct reference that what is it doing? That yes, maybe part of his story can never end, have that kind of resolution, but it can actually defer an ending, point to another story, which is part of this uh, repertoire of storytelling. Uh, which is about the peers, and they're usually seen as riding on tigers, not on horses, over here. Now, okay, um, 
Yeah, now here, this is again a tiny little scroll. I've just taken out this image where you see Bush and Bin Laden represented together in the inset. And the song uh, that was, this the artist was also the composer of the song, where the, the song ends with that there will be no peace unless Bush and Bin Laden become brothers again. Now remember, all this is long before Bin Laden is discovered and nobody knew whether he was alive and dead. So what happens is, because the ending is open-ended, it is uncertain, there's a lot of creative potential that that indefiniteness, that deferment of the ending already develops. Multiple modes which are played, which then lead to this play between the first register and the last. In between, there isn't that much change going on. You know, you still show scenes of relief and rehabilitation, scenes of pathos, you show the war and you show the... But it's between the first and the last that there's a lot of innovation that happens there. And I have, I'll just show you some quick pictures. Okay, now this was very interesting because it, this, this, these multiple images of Osama, was he living, was he dead? Already that sense in which he was a virtual presence in people's lives. You saw him on those video clips. You didn't actually see him alive. You didn't know whether these were recorded before. And there was a lot of play on this. Uh, using the TV screen as a frame, I have many scrolls on that, to border. There's usually a floral border uh, that frames each register. Often these took the place, so very much like the graphic novels that came out after 9-11, actually. This play on, on the virtuality of the image itself through television and other such electronic, which, which gives it a kind of presence, which leads to the uncanniness of this whole situation. Okay, now look at this. Um, and these, these are the last two registers of another very long registers where you actually see a tree of life growing right through the war scene. And typically here, there's no question. This is the mazar, the grave of a peer, a tomb of a peer. Yet, nowhere in the song is this ever mentioned. But somewhere that indirect, that, that side shadowing, it's been called side shadowing by people like Morrison and, and Hiltbeitel, where uh, stories, mm -hmm. of course, within the narrative itself, by rearranging events, uh, you can move back and forth. You can create an anticipation of something, you can go back. So the past can come into the present, the future can be anticipated, known before, depending on how you arrange the events in the narration. But here what you have is a side shadowing. So it's as if you're po pointing to a, a parallel story which will never be the culmination of this story. It cannot be. He's a real figure. You can't do what you like with him. He's the villain of the piece here for sure. But it's as if you're already indicating another set of stories which take a different route altogether. Um, okay. Now, what happens then, I'll just take another couple of minutes. Huh? Now, what happens there over here, I, the creative energy of this mode, of, of the story, of the Bin Laden story, of 9-11 story, it's called the Laden pot in Bengali, uh, really sort of um, burnt itself out uh, by the time Osama was discovered and killed, actually. So it's somewhere as if reality <laughs> overtook the imagination. And I have seen just one pot that was uh, painted after this event happened. Actually, it wasn't going anywhere. They just appended another register which shows a bloody body lying spread eagled after this. Now, sure, the, and, and only one. So clearly somewhere, I think creative energies, it, it sort of acquired a fixed contour. And people are not in. They don't know what to do with it beyond a point. So there's a very interesting relationship um, between, I think, between stories and real life. Endings are always the problem. Of course, stories in a living storytelling universe never end. They usually end with a deferment, a question, which will be answered somewhere else. You have to, you are, so somewhere along the line, any storyteller in a living, and comic books do exactly the same. I mean, we all come from living storytelling traditions. There's always a metatextual reference, as there is over here. Yeah, you're being asked to, you're, you're being pointed to some other region in that universe. It's almost as if each one of these images is like a flashlight, 
a torch throwing light on some other part of the network now so therefore end of one story i'll very briefly mention now but interestingly and i don't think this is going to go anywhere because this was an experiment which i participated in and i was lucky enough to be able to do that uh, about trying to see whether this tradition could also tell stories in a different genre and typically the graphic novel genre so um i actually asked some of the artists to go with me i uh, had met these publishers of children's books in chennai madras um who do wonderful things with the relationship between words and images as comic books do it's not as if they are like children's picture books here you have the picture you hear you have the word that there is a very creative dissonance very often and the reader has to try and fill in the gaps and the contradictions work through the contradictions now in the morning there was an uh, there was a lecture demonstration by one of our early graphic novelists orijit sen um and in the afternoon uh, the artists there were four of them experimented they chose their own stories most of them chose stories from the rama and the abduction of sita i won't go into that but one of them montu uh, he uh, this is his picture of the gujarat earthquake uh, anyway first register he chose the bin laden story again to see whether he could turn it uh, he could tell the story in this different way now the first problem was uh, these stories don't need the protagonist keeps shifting so they don't need an internal storyteller because remember the the story is known in advance all stories all traditional stories are known in advance so it's not the plot that you emphasize your creativity what you linger on is an sense of emotion the ras hmm? the moods of the story depending on so each one of these pictures can lend themselves to be interpreted through a variety of moods pathos wonder fear devastation etc very often artists play with two emotions this is um, doesn't take a lot of time so they can't do more than two at a time so it's as if through these a distillation of the emotion itself you think about the relationship in its abstraction that is conflict opposition that emerges in closeness that was what i talked about now over here the first problem is montu had to find a protagonist within he had to assume the story wasn't known so he needed a plot so let's see what happens what he did was he chose as his protagonist the plane right so this is a fragment of the plane now typically then now it's something he wouldn't have had to worry about because the other stories are known where do you locate the protagonist where would the protagonist be able to tell his story obviously in a museum now he was the one person who could who got the idea of changing panel sizes as being part of the story telling so he put those little vitrines up there um you know with with motifs of his favorite things he loves painting peacocks and um fish tigers uh lobsters those kinds of things cows so he says a museum should be full of beautiful things so you have those beautiful things and uh actually there was no frame for the rest but uh, there there was a foot just to show what would happen if you put words words in put in some more borders and the story as he told it uh to the person who edited the images were translated into english so you have the story from the plane's point of view here is this innocent plane passenger plane huh who's carrying all these peacefully carrying passengers and is hijacked what happens after that he was he found it very difficult he got the idea that comic books break up a single event into or a single gesture uh, into multiple sequences you can prolong action uh, in this tradition they actually shown as condensed and synoptic so you'll have many different actions in one register so it was, so he got that idea very well and he loved it so he kept showing the plane going closer and closer and closer and getting more frightened about what it was being forced to do uh, after that he didn't know what to do so what they did was they removed the beard he had a beard osama uh, from the first image okay as i remember it seemed a fine day but then right he's been forced and already you can see that he tried to give that expression of helplessness 
which the lack of beard helped. He tried by showing worry lines, etc. Um, and you can see the tears. He was very insistent that they keep the tears on the plane's face as he goes towards the tower. And of course, see, remember, a comic book has to deal with a radical before and after structure. The before and after must be in a relationship of inversion. This is a discrete story. It doesn't refer to a larger storytelling tradition. This is complete. So it has to begin, it has to end. So all it says was something evil was inside me that day. And the last scene you have is the scene of devastation. I'll stop here.